I'd like to talk for a bit, and uh, th this, this portion of the video is going to be a bit of a tangent here. But I want to talk about human nature in relation to Hollywood, uh, you know, the movie industry and all that. When dealing with the aspect of fear, primal human fear, what do we see from Hollywood or the video game industry or any other medium by which fear can be conveyed to the masses for the purposes of public consumption and entertainment? We currently have no possible conceptualization of what an alien species might look like. And yet we know that out there, you know, somewhere, there's probably life other than us and there's probably intelligent life. Uh, intelligent life that could be significantly more advanced than us, technologically speaking. Uh, intelligent life that might be hostile and militant even. Now, the human animal sure does love his threat narratives and, you know, we're fascinated with the, with the visceral beauty of our own impending doom and, and of course, uh, along with that, our struggle to avoid it. But unlike, for example, with a zombie apocalypse, uh, which we can at least visualize, uh, we can visualize the biochemical process of zombification. And we can do this because we know what happens to a human body after death, you know, bodily decay and decomposition and rigor mortis and all that. So we can extrapolate that to a reanimated brain thirsty corpse. We can't, however, do the same for an alien species since we've never seen them if they even exist at all. So we do what we do best. We attempt to define an unknown fear by conflating it with things we're already afraid of. And so in our conceptualization of what an alien species might look like, we see this theme of the foreign yet familiar, the intelligent insectoid or, or cephalopod coming in to fill the unknown void of what we think an aggressive alien species would look like. And so with that said, uh, let's attempt to analyze how alien invasions are portrayed by the best cinematographers of our species. Let's take, for example, uh, the Reaper invasion of Mass Effect 3, which as far as I'm concerned is, is easily the most convincing and terrifying scene of a hostile alien invasion produced to date. If you really try to imagine how you would feel during it, if this was going on and you were right there watching this happen, and unfortunately I can't risk another copyright strike, so I, I can't upload uh, the video of the Reaper invasion in this, in this video, I, I wanted to do that, uh, but I can't take that risk, so I'm gonna have it uploaded to my Rants channel, uh, and it's gonna be right in the description box, and the instances in which uh, I want you to pay particular attention to are uh, cited in a time frame, uh, along with the link to the description box. So uh, whatever I'm talking about, you'll be able to find it and the uh, time frame that it occurs in a video right here in the description box. So watch this invasion, watch this video in the description box and really try to visualize if you were, for example, the little boy in this scene, witnessing this massive sentient machine descending down on top of you. Try to conceptualize the primal fear you would feel. Try, try to really visualize yourself in that situation. Now, what I, what I really want to point out to you here specifically is how the Reaper in this invasion scene rears itself up, uh, gearing up for attack. Now, the animators that thought up the Reapers mask it pretty well, but that action, uh, if you're interested at all in animal kinesiology, that's the movement, uh, almost exactly, of an arachnid. It's, it's the movement of a scorpion adopting its defense posture. And there's another scene, if you pay attention uh, to when it descends, and of course, again, that's in the description box, check that out. Uh, but when you watch these reapers descend with their tentacles expanding, these are the movements of, you know, various species of cephalopod, uh, particularly the aggressive displays and, and the mating rituals of the cuttlefish. So, so we see this cuttlefish movement during the reaper invasion uh, descending down iconically over the bridge. Whenever we visualize alien invasions, for some reason, we, <laughs> we, uh, we, we like to see bridges destroyed and capitals destroyed and the Statue of Liberty and the White House and so on and so forth. But we see it uh, descending over this bridge iconically, and it's opening its, its segmented tentacled maws, and it's employing the exact same kinesiology of a cephalopod. It's a, it's a tentacled squid ensuring that the last thing its prey sees before it's consumed is this terrifying little animal gesture of aggression. And this is the same reason why we fear a tarantula's aggressive posturing. Uh, segmented limbs and aggression displays in the anatomy of deep sea cephalopods and crawling arachnids, they're foreign to us. And at the same time, they're familiar to us, but they terrify us altogether. And I'm going to eventually get to my point here, but bear with me a little bit longer. If we look at the patterns of the various types of cephalization, uh, the shapes of the heads uh, of the various creatures that Hollywood has dreamt up for its most famous depictions of alien species, 
uh, we can look at, for example, a side-by-side -side comparison between the invaded alien species of Independence Day and compare it to the alien species we saw in uh, the modern uh, version of the War of Worlds. We, we notice these elongated heads, this, this intelligent, cephalized, but very foreign, almost reptilian appearance. We see this reptilian cephalization most dramatically with Ridley Scott's uh, Aliens franchise, specifically that of the Queen, who herself was modeled after the deep sea creature uh, Franima sedentaria. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but there's a link in the description box about that interesting little creature. And, uh, you know, one look at this creature displays exactly what I mean by familiar yet foreign. The, the, these foreign little creatures are what we use to draw inspiration for, uh, for unknown terrors. This is how we conceptualize and give shape to the unknown terror of an alien invasion. And if we look, for example, at the District 9 alien species, whose face seems to be an, an, an amalgamation of a cuttlefish in the mouth and a forehead that seems to have been copied by a trilobite fossil, and, you know, we, we have these two large sets of insect antenna, we see these themes occurring over and over and over again. So what's the point of me bringing all of this up? The point is that there are patterns, uh, you know, a formula, if you will, for producing, uh, artificially producing, primal human fear. We're afraid of segmented spindly limbs and insectoid noises and tentacles. We're put off by naturally colored eyes and erratic human movement. And that's why zombies move the way they do in our movies. And, and they all have this discolored iris indicating their disease. And an entire movie industry has sprung up around these innate fears of the human animal. Now, in any movie industry, there's, of course, uh, profits to be gained and capital to be generated. So these people creating these flicks with their multi-million dollar upfront investment costs, they have to be able to be sure that they're going to deliver a quality product. That is, they have to provide the customer an opportunity to commune with primal human terror in a safe, controlled environment. So that is to say that these directors and movie producers are in the business of selling the best visceral reaction to subconscious human fear they can possibly elicit on a mass scale. These people must, their job mandates it after all, they must understand what drives visceral human reaction and fear, they must understand and encapsulate what terrifies the human animal, and they must reproduce it on the silver screen. Millions of dollars ride on their ability to do this. And, and this is far from something new. Uh, because if you look throughout our history, uh, if you look throughout our history in terms of the Roman Colosseum and, and you know, their public executions and gladiatorial events in which, uh, in certain instances, tens of thousands of people were, were slaughtered, massacred in one day. One day. That's all you need to know to tell us that, as a species, we have a morbid fascination with violence and death. And, and thankfully, with the advent of the silver screen, we can now satiate that without any actual violence. Nobody has to die in order for us to get our, our, our need to view violence and destruction and blood and gore satiated. The point is to illustrate to you the power contained within the accurate human generalization. Uh, slasher flicks and Saw and Halloween and sci-fi and Mass Effect and the supernatural and demonic and the paranormal, and, and the omen, and, and poltergeist, and the exorcist. How many tens of billions of dollars have been generated by movie industries simply by understanding a small section of the human instruction manual having to do with fear? How is it that these people were able to gain such an understanding of the human instruction manual dealing with this tiny subset of human fear and use it to get hundreds of millions of people to part with the hard-earned fruits of their labor every weekend at the box office in hopes that this human instruction manual is used by these movie producers to sufficiently tickle their primitive senses? You see, in the future, and, and even throughout our past, the most powerful and capable ones amongst us will always be those who understand the human instruction manual. This is where the true source of power resides. It doesn't reside in the halls of Congress, in the halls of Parliament. It doesn't reside on a two and a half by six inch green piece of paper. It doesn't reside in a constitution. True power lies in the understanding of what makes us tick. And this is what is happening right now Today, the unwashed masses, the plebeians, us, <laughs> have decided to delude our understandings of human interaction, to occlude it behind love and honor and jealousy and fear and morals and traditions, you know, and love that can be reproduced identically by MDMA or oxytocin, and I'll cover that in another video. But this is what we've done, while the most power-hungry amongst us have chosen instead to delve deep 
and deeper than ever before into what motivates the human animal in order to exert control over and influence him. Now, with the advent of social media and Google and the like, think about what humanity has unleashed into the world, unconsciously. Because one of the interesting things that we human beings arrogantly choose not to understand or acknowledge is that technology is a funny thing, and that no matter how man tries to impose himself on his creations, the ramifications of his technology follow their own course long, long before we begin to exert our ethics and our regulations into the picture. But again, with the advent of social media and Google and Facebook and Twitter, we've unleashed onto the world a bit of a Pandora's box of human nature, haven't we? Take, for example, this article from Science Daily, and, that's, and this is in the description box, that says that with the advent of these technologies, we've created a situation in which they claim uh, something like 90% of the world's data uh, has been generated within the last two years alone. And the data to which they refer is, of course, mostly unconscious data, since obviously there's a vast amount of information that humanity has accrued in printed books that helped us get to the Internet age in the first place. But in terms of unconscious human data, that is, data that signifies to whoever's curious enough to look and whoever possesses this data, data that signifies our spending habits, our internet search history, our internet medical inquiries, our taste in pornography and our expression of sexuality, our deviancies, our, our travel habits. There's just a staggering amount of new information to wrap your head around floating around somewhere in cyberspace. And this is why it's key. It's key that your average human being, both men and women, begin to take a keen interest in a long, honest, brutal, and unforgiving assessment in just what kind of being or animal or creature we really are. Because I assure you, I assure you, Google and Facebook and YouTube and the people that own these mediums, they already have enough information about the human animal stored somewhere in some super server somewhere. And they're waiting patiently for computing technology, uh, quantum state data processing, for example, which isn't that far off, by the way. These entities are waiting patiently for computing technology to catch up so that it can sort and collate this prodigious amount of data. And when they do, well, let's just say that I'm not afraid of Karl Marx. I'm not afraid of cultural Marxism or any of these uh, boogeyman mythologies. But what I am afraid of is Google and Facebook and their data mining and their algorithms that will eventually tell them more about us than we even know about ourselves before we even know it. You see, humanity's potential enslavement isn't going to come about because some idiot wrote some manifesto, and it isn't going to come from any left or right-wing politicians. And this is why I shy away from, you know, theories about elites and, and whoever, because one of the things that you have to understand, and this is probably somewhere in, you know, Sun Tzu's manual on, on warfare or something like that, but what you have to understand is that true power, true power is always invisible. You can't see it. True authoritarians if they do it right, will make you sign on to their tyranny willfully and gleefully. That's how true tyrants operate. The tyrants under the tyrants. Or above, I should say. True tyranny is some idiot libertarian cult member going on and on about getting the government out of our lives and preserving our right to privacy while he voluntarily goes to his nearest Apple store and clicks away on his iPhone 5S fingerprint scanner. That's right. You see, all of the information that Google now has on you it got it 100% with your consent. You signed on to their email. You used their search engines and you ignored every one of those terms of use statements. You clicked I agree and that was that. And you did it for the same reason fighter pilots can laugh while they're killing Iraqis, knowing they're murdering people, but not having it register because it's through some fuzzy detached infrared image that's a thousand kilometers away. There's no human interaction, so we tricked ourselves into thinking that no one was recording all of our internet activity, but I assure you, I assure you, Google was. And it's highly unlikely, but assuming that there exists somewhere some, some sort of cabal of elites, you know, planning and shaping world events, the hidden hand, do you really think they'd let the proles know about it in some uh, manifesto, in, in some, you know, <laughs> David Rockefeller memoirs? Please. No, you see, what's most likely the case is that there are no elites. There is no hidden hand. What there is are various competing interests, organically formed, with no explicit nefarious agenda other than maybe profit for themselves, trying to use human fodder for their own ends. And alongside of this, uh, there are sequential technological advancements 
the internet, for example, and Google and Twitter and the like, that create a situation in which a deeper understanding and predictability regarding the behavior of the human animal can be gleaned. And this novel information can only be ascertained once technology creates an opportunity for a novel expression of human nature to manifest itself.